Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Corey. I work on the, uh, the Open Space Project at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, we're very excited to be bringing you this uh, special live stream about the James Webb Space Telescope in partnership with Sarnet's NASA at my library and Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And with me here are two of my colleagues from the American Museum of Natural History, Jackie Faraday and Carter Emmer. Hi. Hi, hey everybody. Um, also with us here today in the chat, we will be answering some of your questions. We have two scientists, Marina Gemma, who is a planetary scientist at the American Museum of Natural History, and Emilino Medina, who is a junior in astronomy at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. So I'm going to hand it over to Jackie and Carter and pop in with some questions. Thanks. Thanks, Corey. Great. Well, we're, we're excited to show you the James Webb Space Telescope tonight, and uh, and what it does. And um, I'm just uh, I wanted I wanted to ask uh, if you can all see the telescope, and uh, and I may ask my colleague uh, Micah to actually uh, it to switch over to um, his graphics if that's okay. I, it's looking good to me, Carter. And we're showing mine. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we're having a few technical difficulties. So um, I, I think uh, that's fine. What I wanted to do was uh, um, just uh, introduce this, uh, introduce the telescope. It's a, it's a very interesting design. You see the sun behind this sort of diamond shape. And uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of the details of this. But this is a tremendous telescope. The mirror itself is uh, is is seven times the, the size of the Hubble uh, Space Telescope mirror. Overall, the overall dimensions of Hubble that was uh, sized to fit in the, uh, of course, the American uh, Space Shuttle um, uh, that uh, took up the whole back of the shuttle, which we're not using anymore, that uh, is roughly about the same uh, size, is a little bit shorter. Corey, you actually have a picture, I think, of the size comparison that might be useful at this point. Thank you. So here we see the Hubble over on the left and we see the web on the right. But you can also see in this picture, you can see two figures. So you're seeing a person down at the bottom, we see uh, the two and a half uh, meter diameter mirror that was on the Hubble Space Telescope. And if you think of all the amazing pictures that the Hubble did, um, that the James Webb um, having a much larger mirror uh, has a, a much greater light gathering capacity. And uh, so this is a very exciting telescope. But the technology uh, required to get a telescope of this size into space is an awesome endeavor. We also show in this picture Spitzer, which is um, basically the, the greatest infrared telescope uh, that's been up there. Um, and uh, you'll be seeing some images in reference to Hubble images of sort of the best of what we've got that uh, are targets that the Hubble, that uh, I'm sorry, the James Webb will be looking at. So if we go back to just the image of the telescope, um, Micah, could we actually go to uh, the beginning of the mission? Uh, what we're going to we're going to talk about how it gets out here to this uh, this deployed shape, but this is how we launch it actually, and uh, it's all folded up, and every fold is uh, is important. Uh, this telescope. On this telescope that's fueled by um, several billion dollars of, of American uh, tax money, it's been launched by the European Space Agency, and uh, it carries the hopes and dreams of uh, the scientific community in so many ways. And we're, what we do is, uh, when we're flying out from Earth, we have the Earth in the background. We're deploying um, this very important uh, solar panel which gives it its power. And we see the Earth receding, and that orbit that's going around every hour and a half, 90 minutes, is the Hubble orbit. 
So we're emphasizing how this telescope is going much farther away from Earth uh, than the Hubble telescope. And we're doing this to keep it out where um, it's far away from the influence of Earth and, and it's nice and cold out there in space. We also see a uh, lunar orbit and uh, something else is deploying right now. These are um, the forward and aft uh, pallets that carry the sunshade that we saw that opens up into a diamond. So if we could move around to the other side, Micah, we might see that or spin around. You can see the mirror is uh, uh, needs to be unfolded into place. We're gonna see that later, but these two pallets actually deploy first and uh, that carry the sunshade. And also uh, one other thing that was deploying a little yellow um, communication antenna. So, um, and so, um, the solar panel is going to basically charge or every uh, interaction uh, with uh, uh, basically with light is, is charging um, up the energy that's going to run this telescope that gathers light. We're actually powering it by light. And that little yellow antenna at the bottom is going to carry all the data, all the images that we see. Very important that it's going through that antenna um, from James Webb on back to Earth. Now it's being deployed over on the right is a momentum um, uh, panel, basically. And this, uh, this allows the telescope, which is so sensitive to pointing that um, it's, it's so large with its deployed sunshade, which you're about to see, um, that uh, it's important to have this momentum trim, trim tab that's opposite the side of the mirror. And so now we see the booms extending first one and then the other. And uh, Micah, if we could swing around to the other side, we'll see as this, as this comes out, there are multiple, um, there are multiple layers to the sunshade. And uh, that the, basically once the, the, the uh, multiple layers are deployed, it then stretches them into place. And so this is, this basically, this elaborate deployment is all because if we were to put a tube around all of this, the tube would exceed the size of the, the largest launch vehicle capacity that we had when this was being designed. So it's being launched uh, from French Guiana um, by the European Space Agency's uh, Ariane 5. And uh, so all of this had to fit into the launch route of that launch vehicle. So what's uh, being deployed now is the secondary mirror on this tripod that we see. Um, if we could come in a little closer, we might uh, just see that all of the light that's going to be focused by these gold mirrors and the gold with sensitivity to the infrared. Jackie's going to talk about the science on that. But here we see, um, they call this the bipod of mirrors on either side, the sort of ears, if you will. Um, they have to be folded into place to lock the whole uh, mirror together. It's a parabolic shape and so it focuses the light that would now be behind us, focuses that all to this little secondary mirror on the tripod and then in turn that mirror sends it into that uh, black um, sort of box cone in the middle and if we could swing around to the backside, Micah, we'll see on the backside is the integrated science instrument um, uh, uh, basically a mechanism here so that uh, um, uh, it's basically where all the instruments uh, are on board the telescope. So with that, uh, the deployment that we show here in about five minutes of deployment will actually take 30 days. It goes out to a place called Lagrangian II. This is, uh, this is sort of a gravitational balance point uh, that has to do between the gravity of Earth and, and uh, the sun. And it's a fairly stable place to put telescopes. Uh, we put the Gaia mission out there, the Planck mission, and the Herschel mission from the European Space Agency, uh, which was also an infrared telescope. And so uh, what I'd like to do is if we move away from here, we can show actually the trajectory that it took. Um, this 30-day deployment sequence takes about 30 days to, to get out to L2. So one month, um, we pass the moon in about three days. So the farther out we go, the slower it goes. And so there we see the Earth and the moon's orbit around it. And uh, so we'll pull out a little farther, if we could, please, Micah. There we go. We have a nice label of this. And um, so uh, the moon's orbit, and we see a little point there. I might ask Micah to turn on a larger point. Uh, it's going to say, 
uh, Lagrangian points, uh, one and two. And so this is some basic physics, uh, uh, these, these Lagrangian points, these fairly stable places that we can put telescopes. L1, we had the SOHO um, uh, spacecraft that uh, observed the sun uh, for, uh, I think it's still observing the sun. And um, so this path that gets us out to L2 um, is, is not, the, the telescope just doesn't sit there. It has to go into what we call a halo orbit. So uh, if we speed up time, we will begin to see this, uh, this interesting uh, orbit uh, that it does. And uh, by comparison, uh, we're, we also see uh, tiny between L1 and L2. We might swing to the side a little bit if we do, but we speed up time and, and uh, we'll begin to see uh, transition from the path from Earth on out to this place. We'll, um, we'll then see uh, uh, this uh, um, orbit, this kind of horseshoe halo orbit uh, that, that it uh, subtends as, as, uh, um, as time progresses. And um, as we do, uh, hmm, okay, I think we're just beginning to see it. I might ask Micah to go a little faster. <laughs> and uh, for a comparison, we can see the moon going around the earth every month, every month, <laughs> which takes about 28, 30 days. You know, every month is about 30 days. And, um, but by comparison, and that line that Micah just brought up goes um, from the earth to the sun and on out to L2. And uh, we can see that the moon goes around sort of faster than uh, the James Webb is going to basically uh, circulate around, uh, uh, around L2. The important thing to see here, however, is that the telescope always remains outbound from the sun. So, um, and as the Earth goes around the sun, and uh, uh, the telescope is um, once again, it has its sunshade and orientation so that it can never look toward the sun. The good thing is as we go around the sun every day, uh, 365 days a year, 360 degrees in a circle, that uh, every day we get just a little, a little bit more than a degree on the sky as we sort of progress around. So in one year, the telescope will have uh, basically full access to the entire sky. So um, what am I talking about? Well, if we come back closer in to the telescope, uh, we'll be able to uh, just see once again uh, the uh, sunshade deployed. Um, and uh, we can just talk about uh, that, that uh, view from, uh, from the web. So as we come back in, uh, we might slow down. And uh, if we get closer, the label will disappear. And then we get up close to the telescope again. I think also as we get close, Carter, I see there's a question. Corey, do you want to bring this question up from, we've got Jacqueline Billerman in here. Yes, who I saw earlier in the chat has a 13-year-old with Jacqueline. So this might have come from that 13-year-old um, asking, is there an advantage to the hexagonal shape of the mirrors? Um, yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Jackie, do you want to take that or I, I might take a stab at it? Sure. Well, uh, I mean, I can tell you that this is not the only he hexagonal mirror right. that exists. The Keck telescopes, which are in Hawaii, have it. Um, there's several other telescopes that actually employ this strategy. And it's in part because you got a really big mirror. And so you create this honeycomb shape in order to grow the mirror without having to have to spin a huge structure. So uh, it's complicated to spin a mirror that, that that is as big as we have for the James Webb Space Telescope and not have it crack, have a problem, have some sort of issue. And this is nice because it can fold out and then back in. It's got a shape that's flexible. Carter, do you yeah. want to add anything to that? Well, just and the important part of that is that it has a continuous across the assembled surface parabolic shape. And uh, that parabolic shape enables us to focus all that light. Look, look how big that mirror is and focus all that light to that secondary. And that secondary actually is round. Um, nothing special. Again, it's, it's another parabolic uh, mirror that then focuses that into the, uh, the box cone there, which is where the instruments are. So with all, all of this uh, light gathering capacity, 
um, we might uh, we just want to bring up what the telescope sees as kind of a field of view. So we'll, we'll kind of complete this technology just by showing, uh, Michael will bring that up, um, that we can show the field of view um, as it goes off into the sky and then also see that light gray area that just came up. So here we see the telescope looking off in, into this light gray area and um, that, um, uh, that that is basically the safety region um, for uh, the sky that the telescope can observe. And uh, so that is contingent on what, uh, you know, as, as we go around the sun, of what, what part of sky we can see. So um, all of that is interesting uh, just in so far as how we get there um, and uh, gather the science and send it back to Earth. But uh, Jackie, uh, I think now we ought to just talk about uh, how we sort of access the whole sky and the science that we're going to see. Yeah, sure. So I'll give you guys a little bit of a taste of this as I am one of the astronomers that's using the James Webb Space Telescope in the opening cycle of it. And like many astronomers, I am waiting with bated breath for that deployment that uh, Carter was just talking you through. The launch, by the way, is mark your calendars, December 18th of this year. Weather permitting, uh, all other technical issues permitting, we will be a go as the James Webb Space Telescope arrived in French Guiana, which is where it will launch from yesterday. So it's there, and now we wait to see for this launch that's happening in, gosh, just like just over two months. Uh, and so um, one of the questions that we get asked all the time is why is the James Webb Space Telescope all the way out here a million miles away from the Earth? The Hubble Space Telescope is just a couple hundred miles above your head. So why, why, why is it so far away? And the answer is everything to do with temperature. Where the James Webb Space Telescope is, it's nice and cold. You're away from the Earth and the Moon and the heat from those two very big, very gravitationally and, and tidally significant objects in the vicinity. And so you want it to be nice and cold. And now Micah's kind of turned down um, the, 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 the field of view for James Webb. So you can really see this gorgeous nighttime sky, which those of us that have been to even, you don't even have to go too, too far into a nice nighttime sky and you start to see some of these nice bright stars. Now this is more of a Southern Hemisphere look. We've got the, the large Magellanic cloud that's kind of coming below us on the lower right hand side. And then the center of the Milky Way is kind of coming up. But notice, this is the wavelength that you would see with your eye. Can you tell that there's like dark lanes in the thickest part of the galaxy? It really looks like there's an absence of stars, an absence of stuff an absence of whatever the astronomy is going to give us. And it isn't an absence of stuff, actually. It's that we can't see through it. It's There's stuff between our eye and those dark areas, those lanes, but you can't see it because light is getting absorbed by dust. Dust is everywhere within the galaxy, especially the central part of the galaxy, which is what we're looking through there. We Jackie, what's that glow of light that we're seeing? Yeah, so now we're seeing towards, that's towards the center of the galaxy there, that uh, I think if we, and, and actually what might be nice is to turn on the constellation boundaries at this part, part, Micah, so that we can see, and then maybe the constellation lines as well. So these are the areas of the sky that, um, that the astronomers have decided we can break the sky up into and these constellation lines really map it out for you and so carter uh, you brought up very astutely that bright area and see how it is marked by sagittarius sagittarius which is one of the zodiacal uh, constellations and that marks sagittarius is the location towards the center of our galaxy so it's like the metropolis of the Just galaxy. like that, that brightest spot in the center there. Um, Jackie, I, I think it was Galileo who, who, when he made the first telescope, he kind of looked at the Milky Way wondering what it was because it just looks like a glow to the, the eyes. But 
said it was, yeah. I, I think the quote was uncountable stars. <laughs> At that so, point, we didn't yeah. even know it was a galaxy. We just thought that this was everything that there was. We've come a long way since then. But, uh, but so this is the visible light that you would see. Now we can take those constellation lines down and the boundaries just for a sec, Micah. Because the thing we want to show you is that that's the, this is the light that we see with our eyes. But now, Micah, if you can bring up the two micron all sky survey image, this is another all sky image that was actually taken from ground based telescopes on Earth. But they look at the sky in infrared light, in the light that your eye cannot see, but a light that allows us to peer into those dark lanes. And, um, and so now all of a sudden compared to the other image, you're seeing structure in those areas that gives us a hint, gives us an idea of the dust. Also, Carter, you can see more stars, right? Can you see more of these red stars that are in here? Yeah, and, and it's like a different sky than, uh, than we would see. So I, I guess that means that maybe bugs see a different sky than us. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's different animals have different receptors in their eyes. So if you have, if you're an animal that can do really well at night uh, and have infrared sensors to your eyes, you would be much, you would have a very different nighttime sky view than us humans with our very limited visible. And let's switch to one. So this is what's called near infrared light. Uh, it lets you see the dust really well. And now, Micah, if you could switch over to the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer and then look at that. Oh, I love WISE. NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer All Sky Data. This was another telescope that was in space. It had to be in space in order to get to the wavelength coverage. Similar to James Webb, it needed to be somewhere very cold. And it is the exact same wavelength coverage as James Webb. It was just a much smaller telescope, less sensitive, less able than James Webb will be at getting really deep and spatially resolved objects. But check out the structure that WISE lets us know is there. You're seeing these great structures, these bubble-like things. As you kind of come around, you can see more of them. Um, just note, note the morphology, note the structures that you're seeing. These are the shapes of dust and much of what you're seeing that traces along the center of the galaxy or the thick, the thick part of the galaxy here is young stars. The galaxy is, is, that's where all of the young stars are. They're born real close to where a lot of the gas and the dust are, which is the thick part of the galaxy. And then they don't move very far because they stay close to their natal environment until they get kicked around the galaxy enough times. So pretty cool that we know that if you can look in the infrared, you see the structure of dust. And that is what James Webb is really going to be giving us lots and lots of information on. Jackie, so, is, it is it true to say that like, you know, we we're talking about this dust and I, you know, I, I think a dust is kind of a negative thing in my apartment, but like, Dust is us. I mean, we're made from dust, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a famous line from Carl Sagan, and we are stardust. We are star stuff. We are also stardust. We have, we came from, we emerged from whatever was, what, when stars are formed, you get leftover residual dust. Now, it's not all the same stuff that's flying around your apartment. Dust comes in different sizes with different part, particulates to it. And that's the other aspect of this, depending on which wavelength that you're looking at, whether it's the two micron all sky survey, which is the one we showed before this wide field infrared survey explorer, they're showing you a different component of that dust. Now it might be, uh, it, it's gonna be fun here because we're gonna give you a tour of some of the highlight objects that James Webb is gonna look at. Um, what do you think, Carter? Are we ready for this? Yeah, in fact, I, it just, it, it called up a, a, a question between like, what these telescopes, these survey telescopes do, I guess they cover like the whole sky, but they don't cover it at really high resolution. And then you need a big parabolic telescope like Hubble or, or now Webb to really focus in on the tiny stuff. Is that right, Jackie? Is that a good yeah, assumption? That's, 
That's exactly right. So that you can think of this as like wise is giving you the full breadth of everything that you could look at. But James Webb is going to only be able to select a very, very small portion of the sky and a small number of objects to do a deep dive on. So this is kind of the macro of it all, the like, let's zoom out and let's look at everything. And then James Webb is gonna zoom in and take us really deep and detailed on a very small portion of the sky. That's the way you can think of the difference between what Wise is seeing here, because I see there's another question in here from Jacqueline again, another Jackie asking lots of questions about whether or not this image that we're showing of the wide field infrared survey explorer is similar to what JWST will see. And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. But JWST is going to give us more information. We will get deeper, deeper into the weeds, like a real zoomed in close up picture. The highest resolution picture you can think of of somebody's face kind of thing after you're zoomed out. That's part of what James Webb's going to do. So why don't we switch to the mode where we can zoom in on a couple of objects? Great. And we thought we thought we'd start you with something very. We're going to start far away and then we're going to come in. And should so we, we should we turn the constellation uh, bounds back on, perhaps? Or yeah, great yeah, idea. Okay. Perfect. And Carter, do you want to tell us where we're going to first? Well, one of the one of the ama most amazing images in history, perhaps, is is uh, where they asked the Hubble telescope to stare at a part of sky that they never they, from the ground we couldn't see anything. It was like the blackest black of like there's, you know, all our telescopes that look there and there's something there, and the Hubble exposed for a very long time. Jackie, how long did it expose for? It was like it's you know, ten days, just over ten days in total. And so they, they could keep returning to this patch of sky and they integrate basically all over time. They, and uh, that uh, we saw nothing there. And so this is the result of staring at essentially the black of the universe, but with our best instrument at the time. And what we got is this field, uh, which, um, is uh, if you've ever looked at the full moon, like with uh, binoculars or a small telescope, that you see a little dark areas. And so this is uh, basically when we zoom in on this, it's about the size of uh, well, Mare Crisium, which is one of the smaller uh, Mare features. And if you have really good eyes, you can just barely make it out. So it's uh, um, I think it's about five arc minutes in dimension. The, the moon is 30 arc minutes in diameter on the sky. But anyway, so this is a small area. And uh, once again, it was like we couldn't see anything there. So we targeted it. This is in Fornax, uh, which is a southern uh, constellation. I might ask Micah to turn on the constellation lines, too, because that, that'll also tell us these, these different patches of real estate that we see. And, um, but then um, what we found uh, in this image was so filled with galaxies, uh, as we'll see in a moment, uh, that it was staggering. Jackie, I, I don't know if there's a count to how many uh, galaxies there, there are. But. Yeah, there, there is a count. It's a couple of thousand. I want to say yep. it's over 3,000. I don't remember the exact number. There's something like three, maybe four stars in that image. And you can kind of see the stars. And, and that's that's amazing that we took an image with so few stars in it. Just think, it's it's teeny tiny portion of the sky. And we're basically looking across the galaxy, our galaxy, through an empty-ish area and all the way out towards the edge of the visible universe. And and what's what's interesting about the the universe and you may have heard it's expanding and all that and uh, so this expanding universe tends to uh what it means is the farther out you look the redder the objects become and so the information that we see with the hubble we're losing a lot because there's more of it in this infrared and so this instrument has this much greater light gathering capacity we'll be able to look at that same area and dive in and compare what that image yet to be obtained will show of things we've yet to discover and see 
so far away and because the light travels at a fixed speed we're seeing baby pictures at earliest galaxies forming and so right. this is this is why we're going through this this uh basically this gold mine in the sky that hubble unleashed and uh, jackie as you were saying i mean this is just a tiny patch of sky so it's indicative of if we could do this for the entire sky yeah so the idea is that we take the deepest deepest image and the 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 guiding principle in astrophysics and our understanding of the universe is that no one direction is going to give you this like insanely unique aspect of the universe it's not like you look here and it's going to look one way and you look here and it's going to look another way the idea is that it's uniform across so as long as you go deep and go far so that you can go all the way back to the farthest things that we can possibly detect you can extrapolate from that and understand that you've taken a slice that is replicate replicatable i don't know if that's a word across the entirety of the sky so you're getting a really good slice of representation and and so we did this with the hubble ultra deep field and it was actually done more than once with a, a deep field with hubble but in this particular ultra deep field they have decided to go deep again with jwst and there is one proposal that's going to be sitting on it for 121.8 hours which is a, law, a significant amount of JWST. Each second of JWST time is unbelievably precious. And they got 121.8 hours to stare at that. And there's going to be an image. It will be a phenom of an image, I guarantee. And it's called W Deep. So look for a W Deep image that might be a screensaver for all of your astro uh, affiliated friends <laughs> in the coming. There it That's, is. There it is. Yay, Micah. That's awesome. the Hubble deep field. Gorgeous. I love this image, right, Carter? This is a good one. Yeah, and the, the galaxies that we see that are larger, those are the ones that are closer. And so, Mike, if you dive in even closer, we might see that, you know, it just it, it's the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, you, you just see there are tiny little things in there. Now, the thing with a cross, that's a star. That's a nearby star. And the structure of the telescope actually makes that cross. Um, but then the galaxies are those tiny little dots. Everything else back there are galaxies. And once again, the larger they are, the closer they are in perspective. And so, uh, and and also, once again, if you think about uh, what we're not seeing because of the sensitivity, this is more toward the visible light and near infrared. Uh, Jackie, you know the details on that, but but that um, this W deep image is going to see all these things that we just don't have with the best instrument ever done, the Hubble, until James Webb has been able to capture. This is an example of science where, you know, this this is sort of the best of the best that's been done. And this instrument's going up there to to just make that that much better. And it's right. a great time to be alive, to actually uh, be witnessing this science that we hope will come in, it all goes to plan. So just imagine this is this is actually an infrared image from Hubble, but we're gonna go to a longer wavelength than this with JWST go nice and deep and get more information on these objects that are in this image. We're just going to see them through a different lens. We're going to get more information about the dust in the oldest ones so that we can get some info on the first stars as they were forming. Very exciting new moment that will come. So uh, the well, dust comes out of the stars, Jackie? The dust tells you what the stars are doing. Dust traces the stars. Just, and we'll see that in several of the objects that we're gonna look at as dust is in the location of things dying and things being born. That's actually, a, 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 feels a little bit funny to have it go with both things, but it does because it's the origin of the object. So um, okay. follow the dust. Um, why don't we go to the next object, Carter? The next one is actually a sure. gorgeous one. And I know you really like this object. Yeah, and I, I'm hoping uh, so I, I just hoping that Micah is having an okay time with this because maybe might have a. Uh, hoping we don't have a technical difficulty. We're looking at a star actually, by comparison, uh, just off the field of the Hubble Deep Field, 
uh, from the sort of best all sky survey that was done from Earth, uh, from Mount Palomar, not with the big, famous big eye 200 inch telescope, but uh, um, a, a survey telescope as, as it was called. So it would get like the whole sky. And then they had a, a sister instrument identical to it uh, in the Southern hemisphere to get uh, what the telescope in California couldn't see. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's what sort of makes up um, the general uh, view, and then we we see the insets of the uh, targets that we want to go to. So uh, it looks like we're since we're still flying around, we could take um, another question, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Corey, yeah. I can see yeah. there maybe one. I see one from G. Dan Belisario. Asking, will JWST allow us to complete our understanding of the far side of the galaxy? Oh, that's a great question. That is. And I will say that, you know, um, what I would suggest, if you're, if you're like super curious about what James Webb is going to look like in its first moments, you can look on this website. It, if you, uh, we can actually drop it in the chat probably. Mm -hmm. And it'll describe for you all of the accepted proposals of what the James Webb is going to point at. It's all like publicly available. And so Dan, to answer this question, I, I've looked through a lot of the proposals, especially in preparation for this program and figured out several of the things that people are gonna do. I can't say that there was anything that struck me as a study of the far side of the galaxy, say, for instance, trying to look through the center towards the other side of the galaxy that we can't see because we're on, uh, we're in kind of the Orion subarm. You have to look through the heavy, dusty part. Um, but Jackie, but uh, just, I mean, different. because because it is in, infrared and we can essentially kind of see through some of that dust, um, I, I would think that maybe we could maybe see farther with this resolving power uh, to possibly objects through all that? Is, is that right? Yeah. Or am I looking, yeah. thinking about it? Yeah. Yes, we can. And so the question would be, does anybody have that on their agenda to actually look at? Because there's been some questions of like, is there a metallicity gradient, like the amount of metals that you get that are how much iron or how much nickel or how much chromium or how much aluminum? all important elements does that vary as you go across the galaxy and jwst could look at that if say you look at the highest mass stars which you can really see because they're bright and brilliant on the other side of the galaxy i so love that, that question is, though it's it's a really good one yeah that is a really good one yeah um, wow what are we looking at now jackie yeah we found our target this is Messier 82. Now, Carter, have you ever looked at this through a telescope? Because yes, and I, I might ask, I might ask Micah to just back off enough because it's it's actually a beautiful pair and it's just off the Big Dipper. Um, and so that's M82. There's M81, which is a nice comparison. We'll see it in just a second. Back off a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. There it is. And this is sort of what it looks like in a in a pretty good backyard telescope. M81 is that nice spiral down there at the bottom. But then M82, it looks like, wait a minute, what's going on with that? Because it seems like it's blowing up or something. So this was always a favorite target when I was a kid looking uh, in the backyard telescope. But Jackie, what's going on here? This is, this is real. it looks like a mess. <laughs> it does look a little bit like a mess, but what, what you're seeing is what's called a starburst galaxy. It's a class of galaxies where when you look at them, they have a tremendous amount of dust and tremendous amount of star formation going on. So new stars are being born at a rate that can be more than 10 times faster than our own galaxy. The Milky Way produces uh, new stars at a rate of like something like three three solar masses of new stars a year. And these can have more than 30 times the mass of the sun per year in new, new stars. And if you kind of zoom in, Micah, what JWST is going to be doing in, a, uh, in one particular proposal, which is going to take 42 hours to just stare at this galaxy, 
And what they're going to be doing is a detailed imagery of the center of this starburst galaxy. It's the closest kind of starburst galaxy. It's the archetypical one that we have, that we know. And it has, towards the center, these super star clusters. We really go over the top with our naming, don't we, Carter? Yeah, I, you know, this, uh, what we're doing here, we're using something called Worldwide Telescope that the American Astronomical Society has put put together uh, originally at Microsoft Research. And we're adding that capacity to our open space software, but it allows us to really zoom in. That's just like to see not only the Hubble pictures, because we see those, you can go to a website and see this, that, or the other, but this, we show where it is in the sky. And as, uh, as, a, as a kid who, um, uh, looked at the sky a lot with my telescope and before computers you had to kind of like look at the constellations and say oh it's near the Big Dipper and and you, we did this thing called star hopping and you look over, oh and you look at the telescope and there it is you know so you feel rewarded that you found this or that but it's like so amazing that the Hubble can see this and now we're sending this massive instrument that's like you know that, that's uh, six six and a half meters in diameter compared to two and a half meters uh, it's just, it's almost emotional to think how much more we're going to see with this telescope. Wow, right. oh, this is like, this is great. Let's look, what, what's going on with this one, Jackie? Yeah, so this is a multi wavelength image where you're seeing the galaxy in mostly visible light running kind of left to right here. And then vertically, what you're seeing is X ray information, highly energetic particles that are coming off of this. And I should have said this, but I don't think I did. The reason we think that it's a starburst galaxy, it's having this burst of star formation, is because it's in the process of a collision, two galaxies colliding, or mm. it just has a major interaction with something big. So a lot of energy is being released, which is what you're seeing in that outflow of that kind of like glow, ghostly glow coming up and down vertically in the X-rays. And then to the left and to the right is the structure of the galaxy invisible and some infrared light in there. So you're seeing a lot of wavelengths here. James Webb is gonna dig deep towards the centrist central core in order to map out what's happening at the engine of this thing, where you get these superstar clusters. We'll be able to look at their chemistry, we're going to look at the shock waves that are happening with all of the dust and we'll be able to say something about how you get such a driving star formation um, area. This is a, I, a great imagery here. I guess this, uh, Jackie, is this, this galaxy is not that far away from us, I guess. And so like, is this probably the nearest starburst galaxy to us? Yep, it's 11 million light years away, and it is the closest of the starburst galaxy types. And uh, that means that it is the best one to look at, because close means that you can get uh, detailed imagery, it's brighter, you can see a lot of structure. So that's part of why this is a primo prime target for the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, but we should, we should go on. Where do you want to go next? Let's do a very famous star forming or uh, supernova remnant, the Crab Nebula. And Carter, you've seen this out of a telescope too, right? Yeah, and it's uh, it's ghostly in a, in a small telescope, but it was amazing that it was actually charted by, I, I think it's recorded by the Chinese in 1054, right? Uh, um, so I guess Eastern and Western uh, sources recorded that there was a bright star so that's when the star, that's when we saw the star blow up. But it, how far away is it, Jackie? Yeah, it's the, the, actually the distance to the Crab Nebula is still in a bit of a debate, but it's something like 6,500 light years away. So, so it happened 6, like 6,500 6, years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's the craziness wow. of light travel time. And, but we uh, saw it like a thousand years ago. So. <laughs> That's yeah. right. We saw it about a thousand years ago. All of a sudden, a new star showed up. And now that astronomers are really good with very, very detailed uh, ability to look to the sky, we know that this is what's left over. This always gives me chills, this thing. It, it, it looks kind of scary and beautiful at the same time. Yeah. 
there's so much structure there there's so much detail in it too it's like the, again the hubble i mean if you if you compared like ground-based pictures to the hubble and 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 this program the worldwide telescope sort of allows you to layer in these different things and and look at these uh different images ground-based versus hubble I, it's just i mean hubble could see so much detail and just to think what the James Webb's going to do. It's, it's it, once again, I, I think I keep saying that, but it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's a generational shift in, in, uh, in the science that we're going to be able to gather. It's, it's really exciting. Right. So as you, Mike is kind of zooming in and you can see, like, you can see some knots, you see structure, like wavy patterns to what your, what, whatever is left there. And so what happened was, uh, however many number of years ago when the super, supernova happened, there had been probably a, a star that's maybe 10 times the mass of our own sun. And uh, those stars don't last very long. And it exploded as a supernova. And when they have these massive, massive explosions, it sends off into space material, whatever was left on the uh, its, its outer atmosphere, even its inner atmosphere goes shooting off into space. You get shock waves that are blowing through the interstellar medium, and it is driving new, beautiful, gorgeous chemistry that will end up leading to the next generation of star formation, which is awesome. And what we want to know, Hubble is showing you the intricate structure of the Crab Nebula, and the James Webb Space Telescope has got at least one, but there's more than one proposal, and in one proposal, they're going to stare at this thing for 23 hours in order to map very specifically the chemistry of the shock waves. Oh, and now Micah has brought up a different image here, and it's showing you the X-rays towards the center. And as we zoom in, you get to see the culprit, the villain behind all <laughs> of this structure. <laughs> and that is this pulsar that's left over. And so it's towards the center of this blue ghostly disc, or I don't even think, I'm not gonna call it a disc. There's, kind of, there's a jet coming off of it. There's spinning material that's around it. Uh, and that is the, the leftover energe energetic uh, arena where at the center you have probably about one and a half to two times the mass of the sun, all compacted down to about a 17 mile radius which wow. means dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. And it is sending this energy into the Crab Nebula, which is something like 13 light years across. And, and it and is heating it. Go ahead, Garth. As it spins, it, it sends out a signal, I guess, that we first saw in radio light or it was discovered in England. And and, and this, this one pulses at like 11 times a second, right? Very fast. Yeah, I'm not sure how many times a second it does, but and, you, and I, I, they called them LGMs for little green men. We thought that they were like aliens signaling to us, and uh, but then we were like, oh no, this is, they're they're naturally occurring. They're they're just stellar corpses, I guess. <laughs> right. We didn't know what these things were, but you could set a clock by these pulsars. They're they're quite phenomenal. Uh, exotic, bizarre objects that do exist in our galaxy and beyond. And so Crab Nebula, man, we're going to figure more out about this thing with the James Webb Space Telescope and get ready because you will see this image. The Crab Nebula image will certainly be one of those images that will be iconic out of James Webb and it will probably be flashing across your social media once it arrives as we see all this exciting chemistry telling us how the next generation of star formation proceeds as we so jackie I, I was just thinking like you know you got this thing spinning right it seems to have a bit of a disc and it has jets it's spinning really fast because like i guess like uh an ice skater and they pull their arms in you go faster because you're compacting and this thing's you've said how many solar masses and it's like 17 miles wide so that's why it's spinning 11 times a second Ooh, uh, Mike has just brought us another of the X-ray images of that nice. pulsar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So These things I, are scary. I'm just wondering about the physics here. I mean, this this is a, a stellar death, but it, it creates what is this like? Like jet? Can you describe like why it makes a jet? 
So that does happen uh, when you get a rapidly spinning amount of material in a disc around an object. You end up with these jets that will come out vertically from the poles of the axis of orientation. Uh, and we see this across different kinds of objects dead stars or um, very degenerate objects like neutron stars. And we also see them in the next kind of object we're going to show you, which is young stars. So, oh, and that was a beautiful transition there, Micah, to show us that x ray information leading into the um to the optical and the infrared image now so those jets that you're asking about carter that end up emerging when you have a very rapidly spinning disk of material which ultimately can lead to an energetic burst off of the poles aka a jet we see them in in dead stars and we also see them in young newly born stars which also have a enormous amount of material that's still orbiting them because they uh, stars are actually formed from the collapse of a giant molecular cloud that starts as a ball and then it goes into a pancake and the stars at the center of it. Uh, and so we're going to go to one called a Herbig Harrow object. It's actually the name given to these very young, just basically newly born stars. And the one we're going to is called HH or Herbig Harrow 212. Herbig I Harrow. love it. It's right next to the belt of Orion. Right. That is where a lot of young stars are. Cool. Gorgeous. Yes. And so there, here's an image uh, taken from a ground based telescope in Chile uh, called uh, the Lucia Observatory. Actually, was this Lucia? It, it might have actually been. Uh, yes, it was Lucia. And it was from an instrument called Isaac. And it is actually an infrared image. So this is the kind of thing that the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to access. It will just give us much more information than what is in this image. And so this is a huge jet. Can you tell that it's a jet, Carter? It really looks like one, right? It's it's funny. It's you know it it goes off on both sides. But Micah, there is there's another image of just like the tiny little thing, the disc in the middle, and it looks like a dot almost. And there it is. And it's we're seeing it edge on. That's why the jet goes off to the left, and upper left, and lower right. But um, and that's imaged by that ALMA telescope that has incredible resolution up in the Atacama Desert. That uh, you know, that's an excellent point, Carter. That's something we should make a point of. Part of why the Her this Herbig Harrow object is a selected source, because we are seeing it edge on. If it were not edge on, if we were staring at it from the top or from a front view, then the jet would be coming at us and we wouldn't be able to see the backside of it. But because it's presented itself to us edge on and nature is just gonna give you all of these orientations, but we're seeing this one edge on. We see the full length and breadth of this jet. And look at that as we kind of come around. You can see these bow shocks, this like bow shaped as the material is pulsing from this young star, sending out lots of energy that slams into the dust, slams into the interstellar medium, which ends up creating really interesting chemical signatures. And so there's a, a James Webb Space Telescope uh, proposal to do seven hours on imaging of this thing wow. to map out the spatial resolution to see these small scale shock details that are moving throughout this flow. We're going to really make out the inner knots, the bow shocks, and be able to show, yeah, look at that. That's great, Micah. You're really pointing out the structures that we're going to be able to give the chemical signature of. Because people, this is where the stuff is happening. I mean, we're kind of zoomed out on it, and James Webb's going to give us a lot of intricate details. On Jackie, I, I was, I, I wanted to uh, mention yeah. that that the Hubble's been around long enough to take pictures and go back to them and stuff that we were able to see with some of these jets, they've actually made movies because we can see the flow moving out. If, and I mean, these the scale is, I mean, no pun intended, astronomical, but the fact that they're moving so fast, even at that dimension that we, we actually see time variance in these things, it's amazing. Right.
Yeah. So look out for this one. This is going to give us some really good information on, uh, uh, and, and to your point, Carter, uh, it's been, we, we've been studying this thing for enough time that the images from the James Webb Space Telescope will give us a baseline where we're going to measure the velocity that some of these structures are moving at. So we're going to compare the images over the years and be able to measure how fast some of these structures are moving. It's a technique that astronomers use for a lot of different things, uh, proper motion measurements, as we call them. And we will be able to do that across the jet with James Webb. I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. This is a good one. Uh, okay, so this is our last image, and I know we're at 55 minutes, or, or we've been on for quite some time, but we wanted to showcase two more things to you. I selfishly want to show you one other thing, and I hope it doesn't crash the software, but one of the, so I had a proposal that was accepted, and it's going to use just over 24 hours of James Webb Space Telescope time to look at 12 objects of the kind that Micah's just turned on for you. So Micah just turned on kind of a cartoon version of, uh, well, not a cartoon, a, a, a version of, of, of objects where we've placed an image where they're located on the sky of things called brown dwarfs. They're objects in between stars and planets they look and behave much more like Jupiter than they do like stars. They don't have enough mass to get hydrogen burning at their core, so they cool for their lives. And I selected 12 of them to study their atmospheres. They don't have a star around them. They're not orbiting anything. They formed probably the way stars do. They may be no more than a couple of times the mass of Jupiter. They were discovered in the infrared, as Micah's just brought up this infrared image of the sky. And I'm going to be pointing the James Webb Space Telescope to 12 of them, 12 very, very special ones that I believe will be highly informative about clouds, about uh, youth indicators, metallicity indicators, how many metals you might have in objects that are planet-like, and there's no star to block away, so I directly image and detect these objects. I am very excited about this. It won't produce these phenomenal images like the ones that we were just looking through. It will produce phenomenal science, though, that will allow us to create graphical illustrations for you that will excite you visually. So I wanted to point that one out. So get ready for brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs are coming with JWST. And then last but not least, we wanted to mention that the other main target of JWST is exoplanets. Exoplanets, exoplanets. Now, Micah has brought up a uh, catalog of stars that have planets around them. They're all circled in blue. We know now that we have over 4,000 planets detected around stars, but we believe that basically every star should have at least one, if not multiple planets around it. That's what the statistics are telling us. And James Webb can only look at a certain number of objects, but there's one planetary system that's gonna get a lot of attention and it's called the TRAPPIST system. So we can fly to it and explain to you why this one is such a major uh, target of attraction. Uh, as the TRAPPIST system was discovered five years ago or so is when it first hit the news. And TRAPPIST is only about 20 light years away, something like that. And um, it is a very low temperature star, real low. It's barely a star. It's almost a brown dwarf, almost like the kind of object that I'm going to look at with James Webb. Uh, and it has seven rocky worlds around it. And as we fly in to go see this system, um, you, what you'll see is seven worlds kind of orbiting this red object, the star at the center. And we're going to be staring at this with the James. All of these planets will get a look by the James Webb Space Telescope as they transit in front of the star or go behind it. That's how astronomers end up 
peering into what the star might be doing when it passes in front or passes behind, we're able to get a glimpse of what the planet's atmosphere might look like. So there are several proposals to look specifically at this system, at the planets, all of the planets in there, and then specifically at the second planet in this system, because we want to know whether it has an atmosphere or not. And Carter, Jackie, why don't you- Oh, go I, was just, I, I was just uh, wondering is sort of point out, in here, it seems like there's a green disc. Um, but what, what we're doing is we're, we're color coding what's called the habitability zone around this star. So in, in close, it's kind of reddish edge and out far, it's a bluish edge. It's sort of red meaning hot and, and blue meaning cold, but green being this zone that uh, is, is uh, a careful definition of, the, the, of how hot the star is and how, how close you would have to be or how far to sort of have a planet um, that might sustain liquid water on the surface. Is that right, Jackie? So this That's is a right. habitability zone. So there's several planets in this system that kind of satisfy this habitability. You know, that doesn't mean that there's life there, but it means that there there's the possibility for surface water. And uh, we, we believe that that had to do with our evolution as life on the earth. So this is really, this is exciting stuff. Yeah. Not too and, far from home. And and I was giving the, the, the distance away is more like 40 light years away. It's about 12 parsecs in, in the yeah. distance, astronomical distance, which equates to about 40 light years, which isn't very far away. It's part of why we're very excited about this system. It's a close by system that is uh seven rocky type worlds likely and you saw how many of them might be in a habitable zone so Jeff, you, you, you 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 also said i, I i'm sorry I, I didn't mean to cut you off oh that's okay oh, i was just you, you said 40 light years away so it's it, it meaning that it's taken that light you know 40 years traveling at 186,000 miles a second to to get to it so we see it 40 years in the past um, I see one of the questions was about how long will the light take, I guess, from JWST to get to Earth. And and uh, uh, the answer to that is, that, you know, the, the light that's reflected off the moon, the moon's a quarter million miles away. You do the math. It's it's about one just over a second. And uh, uh, we see the moon about one and a third seconds in the past. And uh, JWST is four times that distance. So about five seconds it'll take. Uh, the data from JWST to get to Earth, whereas we're seeing a star here is like 40 years in the past. So, right. Yeah. That's a great question, though. Um, yeah. I think we're, we've reached our last target. Corey, were there any other questions you <laughs> want to bring in? Or are we good? You know, Marina and Emilito did a great job in the chat. So thank you both for doing that. And I think we're going to wrap up here for tonight. So thank you, Jackie and Carter, for your great program. I'm very excited about the telescope now. Um, I've put in the chat um, where you can find more resources about web at NASA at my library's webpage. I've also put a survey in the chat. Um, we would love to hear your feedback about this program so we can it's going to get a NASA sticker. Um, and thank you. And see you next time. I want to thank Micah too. Yes. Thank you, Micah. Our hidden yes. hero. Yes. Always. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks. everybody.